So as Chris uh, mentioned, uh, thank you for the intro. I'm uh, the Director of Solutions Architecture at uh, Leap Year Technologies. Leap Year is a uh, relatively new, in terms of a five to six years uh, startup out of the Bay Area. Uh, I myself uh, live here in New Jersey, uh, just one town over from Seton Hall in Maplewood. Uh, but I've been at, with Leap Year for about a year and a half. Uh, Leap Year as a company is focused on the problem of enabling our customers to realize more value from their data by uh, by improving their capability to be able to share data and make it more liquid and uh, and more uh, sort of um, uh, accessible uh, to to partners and and internally, uh, and that's really sort of the, the the gist of this discussion, right? Is about um, what is computational data privacy, um, where is it going uh, in terms of a set of capabilities, and I will jump into that now. Uh, uh, the, one of the reasons I think that you should care about computational uh, data privacy, well, let's first let's step back and define it. Computational data privacy. A lot of the discussion today in cybersecurity. Uh, is about, um, might it be about protecting data that's at rest? So how do you keep um, say hackers from accessing data um, that, that's living on a server somewhere? Um, computational data privacy is about protecting the confidentiality of the data while it's in use. So you're making use of the data uh, to derive some insight, to share it, et cetera. How do you keep the data confidential um, while enabling that, that, that use of the data? Um, among the reasons you should care about this topic is that uh, uh, first, if we step back and think about the sort of macro trends, um, no one needs to remind you how important data is for, for our economy and the, the knowledge economy. Um, the demand for data sharing is simply skyrocketing. There's, real, there's literally no organization uh, that in a large organization, data-driven organization that I'm aware of today, that doesn't um, share data one way or the other, either use someone else's data to enhance their operations or, or allow others to use their data uh, for either profit or um, to sort of enhance, enhance relationships in that way. Data sharing demand is skyrocketing at the same time that data protection requirements are only multiplying. So most people will be familiar with um, so, uh, in, uh, say consumer data privacy protection laws like the one in California, GDPR in the EU. Um, but uh, even above and beyond those, um, there is a, a, a very quickly growing trend of putting more controls on how data can be used uh, and how we treat the individuals that are represented in that data. One reason that I'm drawn to this topic of data privacy is I think we're at a very pivotal moment uh, in our development as a as a you know as a as a species that uses technology. Uh, how will we treat the people? How how will we treat data? Will we treat it as a mere commodity? And that's just there to be optimized at whatever cost. Or does data represent uh, individuals? Does it represent uh, entities? Does it represent, um, you know, uh, I guess there'd be somewhat poetic about it, about it and souls. There are really people who are behind all this data. How do we protect them? And so whether it's by regulation or um, social pressure uh, for companies to be more responsible with how they handle data, certainly the, the trend is that, that those, requ those requirements are only increasing. So uh, if you combine this demand for, uh, to be able to, to share data more broadly with uh, requirements to keep data private, you end up with um, really a, an upswell in uh, demand for various capabilities, implementations around computational data privacy. And I'll go as far as to say that, you know, especially for the, you know, the folks who are early in their careers here, computational data privacy will be part of your future in technology. Um, you're going to come across it more and more, and uh, many of the methods that I described today will be simply status quo in just a few years' time. What I hope you'll take away today, um, an impression of the scope of computational data privacy. There's a few different methods. It's not a, there's not a single um, algorithm or domain um, that really uh, contains uh, computational data privacy, but rather a collection of methodologies that are all meant to solve uh, distinctive types of problems. Uh, it will come away, I hope, with an understanding of the problems that differential privacy in particular addresses. That's uh, a domain where Leap Year is focused, and so it'll comprise a lot of the discussion today. Uh, what I won't cover today is uh, much in the way of formalism or theory. This is meant to just give an impression of the, of the space. Um, with that, a little bit about myself, uh, you know, who, who, who it is that's talking today. Uh, I grew up in a small town uh, in Oregon. Um, data privacy or working in tech was probably far from my mind at, at that time. Um, I uh, joined the military uh, out of high school, uh, was in the Air Force for a number of years, then went back and uh, to school and, and did my degree in physics at UMass. Uh, went on to work at uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory 
for a, a number of years, um, while I was also concurrently involved in sort of non-professional pursuits like music. I uh, did a PhD uh, in environmental engineering at UC Berkeley, uh, where I was looking at impact of climate change on uh, natural systems and have in the, since then been uh, building data science teams for various startups and applying the technology to, uh, to particular problems. One of the threads that, that you can go through this, this timeline for me that I'd like to, to highlight is that um, I've been dealing with a sensitive data in one form or another for, for a long time. And there's a, maybe in that sense, uh, so my work now at Leap Year is uh, something of a, of a culmination of that thing, whether it was working with uh, you know, government classified data for government projects like Lincoln Laboratory, um, or you know, data for individuals and entities in, in various other contexts. Um, I think we all have an intuition for why data privacy is important, but um, we, not many of us have uh, sort of the, the um, uh, I guess the look under the hood to see exactly how, how data privacy is, is accomplished in practice. So I wanna give a few examples here of uh, computational privacy methodologies. And again, I wanna, the point I hope to drive home is that um, this is not a, 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 a singular, single uh, domain or topic, but a collection of, of tools. Um, the problem, generally speaking, that computational data privacy attempts to, to, to solve is a need to extract value and insights from sensitive data without compromising the underlying source. Uh, and we'll make this more concrete through some examples. As I already said, it's, it's not focused on protecting data at rest per se. So, you know, encryption or data access or other methodologies to, to protect the data while it's sitting on the server. It's all about how do I make use of this data uh, while protecting the, uh, the, the sensitivity of the underlying um, source. Uh, the three methods we'll look at here very briefly are uh, secure, secure multi-party computing, uh, SMPC, fully homomorphic encryption, and differential privacy. Uh, so just to, to jump in there, um, the first methodology we'll take a look at secure multi-party computation. So um, uh, I think it's useful to first, what is the problem that it solves? Well, when, if you have multiple parties um, that would like to uh, gain a collective insight from sharing their data, but they don't want to share the data itself with each other, secure multi-party computation is a way for uh, for this to happen. So uh, if you know, the various parties that are here, maybe they all have um, some version of a data set. Um, by combining this data in a way that um, the data itself is never unencrypted at, during the, 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 the process of the actual calculation, uh, they can all derive insights from the shared function. An example, this might be you know, banks that have uh, lists of accounts that have been flagged for fraud. So, you know, individuals within your own, you know, within your own domain, within your own uh, walls, you have a list of individuals that have been engaged in fraudulent activity. You'd like to cross-reference this against uh, the same information that other banks have, but uh, either for regulatory or reputational other reasons, you, you don't want to just simply share that list of individuals. And so SMPC uh, provides a is, is a methodology to enable certain types of calculations to be performed uh, on that data in a way that the, for instance, the information you get back might be a binary indicator of whether or not that um, that individual um, has uh, has also been flagged for for fraud somewhere else, um, or some other sort of representation of of, of that information. So, uh, but the point is that many individuals sharing data, to, uh, they want to have a collective insight, but they don't trust each other um, with the data itself, and SMPC enables these sorts of use cases. Fully homomorphic encryption, um, it's, a, it's a mouthful, uh, but the, the problem that it solves is in some senses fairly straightforward. Um, this is applicable in circumstances where you have an untrusted compute environment. So if I'm a, a, a party who has some data and I want to say be able, to, uh, I want to run some calculations in a data environment that I don't trust, meaning I want, uh, I want to provide my data I want to get useful outputs, for instance, the results of a you know of a predictive model on my data, but I don't trust that that partner or environment to ever have access to the unencrypted version of my data. So uh, FHE um, is a, is a methodology for addressing it. Again, we're not going to go into the mechanics of, of how it does so right now, but one example use case would be you can, uh, say a healthcare company um, has uh, you know th they they have uh, they want to use a third party risk assessment tool. Um, they have all of their own patient data. They provide that data in encrypted form to um, to the, the third party. The third party is able to run a model on that data, provide the result back to the, the data owner without ever having access to the un unencrypted versions of that data. Uh, very, another very, very powerful um, 
very powerful method. One thing to note about these first two methods, SMPC and, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, let's say the whole thing, secure multi-party computation and fully homomorphic encryption, mouthful, is that um, they protect um, access to the to the data. So it's it's a it's a way. There are methodologies that keep the data encrypted throughout the computation process. Encrypted throughout the computation process. But one thing they don't explicitly protect against is reverse engineering of the information. For instance, um, if we go back to SMPC, uh, if you were to share multiple versions of your of your of your customer list. Um, uh, say many iterations of your customer list in an attempt to understand who are all the customers that your that your that your competitors have. Um, it doesn't protect against that explicitly, meaning the results you get back are always exact. It's binary. It's you know it's either yes or no, or it's the the result that computation itself is exact. So they don't explicitly protect against reverse engineering of the underlying data. And that context, I think, will make a little more sense as we talk about what differential privacy is. So the problem that differential privacy solves is when one or more parties want to want to be able to share data, um, or share I should maybe more precisely, but they want to be able to share insights from data, but they tr don't trust the other party, the counterparty, with access to the record level information in the data set. So if we look at the diagram here, you've got some you know, sensitive data that's um, it, you know, comes in from various sources, is stored on a, on a server. You've got this privacy barrier where. Uh, an end user can submit queries, uh, you know, analytic queries, uh, you know, means, sums, uh, train a, a, a predictive model on the, 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 the underlying sensitive data. The answers that they get back um, will always maintain the privacy of the underlying data. So uh, the use case here, if we go back to say banks, if a bank wants to share information about um, their customer transactions with a third party, uh, but they want to ensure the privacy of their customers and, and merchants, uh, an analyst could use the uh, differential private methodologies to be able to craft uh, queries that give them the um, statistical insight from the data without ever being able to access or reverse engineer the uh, information about the underlying individuals. So it's sort of a different, it's, a, it's actually a, a distinctively different problem where uh, the data isn't always kept encrypted in this case. Um, uh, there's no assumption of encryption in the trusted data curator. It's that the results that, um, the analytic results that are returned to the uh, to the analyst are always, um, in, have a, a mathematical guarantee to protect the uh, information of any individual in the underlying data set. So as I mentioned before, that's the focus of, of Leap Year, and that'll be the focus of the remainder of this workshop. We're gonna use this as a particular method to, to hopefully develop some better intuitions about um, you know, the, the underlying ideas and applications of computational uh, privacy. So let's take another view of the problem that differential privacy solves. So let's take an arbitrary individual, uh, image of an arbitrary individual here. Um, for a long time, there have been various methodologies to try to um, protect information in databases, things like anonymization, uh, for instance, where what you're doing with anonymization is you're destroying some element of the data, uh, you know, randomizing it or removing it entirely uh, in an effort to be able to share other elements of the data for, for analysis or to derive information. From others. The, the, the common example of this would be if you're looking at, you know, uh, personal information to obscure social security numbers and, and full names, but allow, you know, other information about the individual to be, to be shared. Um, these methods have really kind of reached the limit of their of their feasibility and when it comes to being able to, to share data. Um, it's, uh, I think, a, a not entirely unfair uh, comparison to say that um, you know, it sort of amounts to, you know, covering up some part of the data, but not providing any rigorous guarantees that it's not possible to reconstruct um, really all of the meaningful underlying data um, in, in a data set uh, via, via approaches like this. So, you know, in this case, we'd say this is an example where is there some privacy? Well, yeah, sure, you're covering up a face, but you're really retaining most of the information, imposing a lot of risk if you were to try to share this information in a way that was presumed to be um, to be somehow pr protecting the, the the identity of the underlying individual. Um, of course, it's trivial to achieve perfect privacy. Um, you can just destroy all the information or not share the data altogether. Um, but of course, this doesn't provide uh, any value, and so it defeats the purpose of computational data privacy. So the real challenge is how do you uh, provide um, uh, enough, how do you provide high value information uh, from the underlying data, uh, as much statistical information as possible from the underlying data while protecting the uh, information of any particular individual. Um, an important concept uh, related to differential privacy is this uh, fundamental law of information recovery um, as, uh, as uh, 
um, uh, quoted here from a, 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 a seminal work by uh, Dwork and Roth, and I'll share a link at the end of this. But uh, the idea is that overly accurate answers to too many questions will destroy privacy in a spectacular, spectacular way, meaning uh, it's n not sufficient to um, to uh, cover up some parts of data or to put arbitrary uh, or heuristic constraints on the types of queries that can be made uh, of a data set and expect that you're really protecting privacy in any sort of meaningful way. Um, this is, I think, best illustrated by, by example of where other methodologies, non-differential privacy methodologies fail. So for instance, um, you might think that if you have a, a database of, of employees and you ask for the average salary and say there's a you know uh, a thousand employees and uh, or some large number of employees and you just ask for the average salary. Well, maybe that query in and of itself doesn't necessarily expose the information of any individual. But it turns out if you remove one person from that database and you rerun the query and now you have a new value for the salary, well, you can exactly infer um, the value of the, the individual that was then left out. So this is a, a trivial uh, sort of privacy attack um, that unfortunately is quite effective on many of sort of the, the historic um, approaches to privacy that attempt to maintain privacy by, by limiting uh, or controlling the, the say the, the number of records that need to be involved in, the, in, in returning a query uh, in this example, for instance. So, you know, in the first query, you might have a thousand individuals. The second query is you have, you have 999, but you know, with that gap, you've actually perfectly exposed, unfortunately, the information of the individual who was missing. Um, another example of this uh, that some people might be familiar with is that uh, the approaches to uh, data privacy where you're again, withholding some aspect of information um, uh, in a data set and sharing the rest of it, um, are they notoriously susceptible to, to reverse engineering? There was a study a few years ago now at, at MIT that demonstrated that uh, it's possible to uh, you know, uniquely identify um, uh, 90 to 99 percent of individuals in a credit card data set, even if there's no um, supposedly uh, uh, personally identifying information left in the data set itself. Um, and this is just by simply uh, the, the method here is to combine external information with that data source and be able to, by process of elimination, uh, identify uh, who, who uh, an individual might be in a data set. So these historical approaches have, you know, unfortunately failed uh, pretty spectacularly. So, all right, so what is, how does differential privacy sort of address this? Um, differential privacy, that the premise is a simple promise. Um, if I ask a question of a data set, I won't be able to tell whether your information or any individual's information was included or excluded from the results of the query. Um, there's an asterisk here that you know specifies that you know I can't won't be able to tell within a defined probabilistic tolerance. Uh, but glossing over that uh, that detail for the moment, the the idea is, is actually uh, pretty pretty straightforward. That it shouldn't matter um, if my information is in, in a database or not, because the result that somebody gets back uh, from a differentially private query of that database. Um, will will not not reveal whether or not I was part of that data set. So if we go back to, I guess, just briefly to say this example up here, um, if when this query is run, rather than returning the exact value here, you know, maybe rather than returning 50,000K, the value is, you know, 49,300. And then likewise, when we return this other value over here, there's, there's something, the point is there's some randomization involved and there's the, the number's not exact, but probabilistically close to the true number. And you do the same after that person's removed. Um, the, the promise of differential privacy is you won't be able to tell uh, with any certainty uh, what the contribution of any individual like Maya was to that, that particular data set. Um, so the, the, the concept of differential privacy is quite, I think, straightforward. There is, of course, you know, the power of differential privacy is the mathematical formalism around this simple idea. Um, one way to summarize it is to say that you know, uh, neighboring input distributions should produce neighboring output distributions. Key question here, what do we mean by neighboring? Well, a neighboring uh, input in this case, uh, my, an, an example of a neighboring data set would be a data set that differs by exactly one record. Um, so one way to think of this this sort of definition is, uh, is uh, going back to the example I just gave, um, with some uh, quantifiable tolerance. Um, if I run a query like a sum or an average or a train a, 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 a random forest model on a data set, um, if I run that on the data set um, uh, that includes my my own data and I run it, doesn't include it. 
um, I have a mathematical sort of guarantee of the tolerance of how closely um, those those results might uh, might be to each other. Um, this is, I think, easier to, given we're not really going to dive into the formalism here, easier to describe in terms of, um, uh, well, we'll jump in and we'll describe in terms of the algorithms in a moment. I think first it's useful to talk about um, what are some of the benefits of the formalism of, of this definition of, of privacy. Um, well, one, uh, and maybe foremost, is that it, it does, it's a, differential privacy is not a particular algorithm. That's one thing to clarify. It's a mathematical standard. Any any computation that meets the the um, formal definition of, of differential privacy, again, we're loosely speaking, it's that it doesn't matter if one record or, is in the database or not, um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the the certainty that you'll have about the, 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 the answer that comes back. Um, because it's a, a mathematical standard, uh, mathematical formalism, it's, it's, it's provable privacy, meaning that when something is uh, differentially private within a certain um, uh, parameterization of it. Uh, it doesn't matter um, how much computation power you have, what other sort of data sets you can bring to bear, or how smart the PhDs on your team are. You won't be able to reverse engineer uh, the, the the information uh, in that data set beyond the constraints of differential privacy. Like as a mathematical standard, you know, uh, an example of mathematical standard might be, well, two plus two equals four. It doesn't matter how many um, computers I throw at, unless of course we get into quantum computing, but that's beyond the scope of this um, this discussion. Um, this also means that this, the privacy is quantifiable and that's measurable. So um, rather than uh, you know taking taking heuristic approaches like like um, uh, anonymization, uh, where there are no rigorous guarantees of privacy, you can actually put a number uh, on and and measure uh, the amount of, of privacy um, that's say exposed in a given uh, a given query of the data. Um, a couple of really important sort of th more theoretical uh, benefits of, of differential privacy. One is um, called composability, which means that if I have uh, multiple differential privacy algorithms, um, I can combine them. A any way that I combine them, I'm going to retain the same differential privacy uh, outcomes. So I can take different building blocks of differentially private um, uh, uh, com uh, um, calculations. One example, for instance, would be you know taking the mean. Um, maybe, maybe I want to use a count and a sum together in some way. However, I combine those together, the 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 outcome of that is also going to be considered differentially private, retain the same guarantees. There are a lot more um, sort of nuanced benefits of that as well, but that's an intuitive one. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, this you know the, uh, already that the differential privacy. Um, is guaranteed to hold under post processing. That goes back to the you know no matter how many PhDs or computers or other data I have, I won't be able to reverse engineer the data beyond what's been specified uh, or been been uh, permitted uh, within my configuration of the algorithm. All right, uh, time check. I'm doing good. All right, so let's get let's make this concrete. Um, I, I I don't blame you if um, the the ideas are still a little fuzzy. Um, I think the best way to really understand what's happening here is look at some examples. There's a canonical example of a differentially private algorithm that's used really pretty much in every textbook because it's pretty straightforward to understand. So uh, let's say you want to, uh, you're doing a study and you want to learn uh, the, the proportion of the population that cheats on their taxes. Um, you could, of course, just go out and ask people this question uh, and uh, you know, just take the data down exactly. Um, you have very little certainty that people would be answering you honestly, uh, because you know, why would they? There are consequences uh, if they if they were to tell you yes, they cheat on their taxes, and that that, that information would ever to become publicly available. Clearly, there would be there there could be significant consequences for them. So, in, in order to um, you know earn the, the trust of the folks that you're querying, you tell them you you you've got this um, an algorithm you've got in place that that gives them, no matter what answer they give you, they have plausible deniability of whether or not uh, it's true that they they um, they cheat other taxes. And so it's simply this. Uh, you ask them the question, do you cheat your taxes? You flip a coin, or I'd say actually the, the individual flips a coin. They look at it, they don't tell you. If it's say heads, uh, then they, they're gonna tell you the truth and they'll tell you, you know, yes or no, they cheat other taxes. Uh, if it's tails, and again, you don't know the answer to that. If it's tails, um, then they'll, uh, uh, actually, I should say to keep this honest, you probably would you would flip it twice. So you don't expose it, but like let's just say, um, if it's tails, um, they turn around, they don't tell you whether they flipped it or not. But uh, they flip the coin one more time. If it comes up uh, as heads, then they sell, they tell you yes, whatever the true answer is. If it's tails, they tell you no. Um, the point just being that 
uh, only 50% of the time are you going to get the truth from them. And the other 50% of the time you have uh, an even possibility, probability um, that, um, you know, that, that, uh, or, you know, you don't know what the, what the, what the true answer is going to be. So this gives every individual respondent plausible deniability, meaning there's only 50% likelihood that they told you the truth. But what you've gained is that you can uh, take the aggregate results of this uh, and pretty, depending on how many samples, of course, you have, um, you can uh, perhaps quite accurately estimate the uh, the fraction of individuals um, that, that 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 do uh, cheat on their taxes. And just to, to make this concrete, that way you would just concretely say, um, well, I'm going to estimate the the number of people who um, who who do uh, uh, who told me the truth about uh, that they do uh, uh, cheat on their taxes. Um, that's going to be roughly equal to um, the number of the, the total uh, number of yeses that I got minus the expected value of the number of yeses that um, of noisy yeses that I would get. So in this case, be to very very concrete, um, you know, 25% uh, of the time I'm going to get a noisy yes, meaning it was you know there's really uh, no meaning to it um, uh, altogether. And so if you combine these numbers in a fairly trivial way, uh, you can come up with a pretty robust estimate of uh, the portion of the fracture of fra the population that that actually um, does cheat on their taxes, while I'll I'll Always maintaining the um, the the plausible deniability of any individual. Um, just the other examples won't take quite as long to, to cover. Uh, so that was uh, you know an example of a uh, what's called sort of a, a local differential privacy where you are applying differential privacy at the point of um, of data collection. So you, as a person collecting the data, don't know whether or not the information you're getting back is the true answer, or if it's been, uh, you know, if it's if it's a variation. Um, uh, there are different flavors of differential privacy we won't get into very deeply here, but if we talk about different types of queries, so if I have a database now, that put ourselves in a different mindset, I've got a database and I want to run a count query. I say I want to just know the, the um, number of individuals whose income is over $50,000 a year. Uh, and the differential private, the differentially private version of this algorithm would return. Uh, it really is composed of two parts: one, the whatever the true value is of my query X, and then some. Uh, a common approach is to use um, Laplacian noise, so a Laplacian distribution to add some some noise to that. And we see that. Um, and what this gives me is essentially a noisy answer in return. And so, if I were to you know ask that question uh, a number of times, I would get a different. Uh, I might get a different number. Uh, I would likely get a, a different number many of the different times that I asked it. If the true value is 50, then sometimes the answer, you know, I, the answer I get is 52. Sometimes it might be 46. Um, the true answer is always going to, uh, you know, have centrality around the true, or, uh, or the answer you get back is always, always going to have centrality around the true answer. But um, by injecting some randomization to the process, you protect the information of any particular individual in there. Um, count is a particularly intuitive algorithm because uh, again, if you're just asking the question, M, for instance, am I, is my information contained in a in a database uh, or not? Um, then uh, you know the, the 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 fact of whether or not I, I appear in that database, um, my presence in that database can only modify the count by at most a value of one, right? If I'm in the database or not in a given count query. Now, very intuitively, so yeah, this is the thing is useful. Um, if we say, look, ask that question of a, of a database uh, with a thousand individuals, and uh, you know the, the segment, the, the query includes all thousand individuals, um, then the result I get back might be, you know, quite accurate. It might be 999, or maybe it's even a thousand, right? Um, but there'll be some uncertainty around it. If I narrow that query down so it's just one individual, just um, just me, say, you know, I, I, I know information about myself and I, I craft a query such that I'm the only one who satisfies that query and I get an, a number back. Um, in this situation, the number will essentially um, bounce between zero and one. If I run it one time, I'll get a one. Yes, I'm there. If I run another time, I'll get a zero. And I'll more or less have equal probability of getting back a one or a zero, um, depending on the specific um, uh, parameterization. And we can see that this, this algorithm is simple. Uh, you can implement this in, in one line of Python code, for instance, and yet it's very powerful. Uh, one, I think, useful note about um, differential privacy as well. Uh, there are, as I said before, differential privacy is not a methodology. It's a mathematical standard. Um, but one of the more common methodologies used that has a lot of benefits um, is, is as I'll describe here. So say I craft my count query. Uh, I'd specify the, you know, the, the segment of the population that I want to look at. My non-private query then you know, uh, runs on the underlying data 
and they get back a value of you know, say 201. That's the number of individuals or names or whose first name is Thomas within say a zip code. Uh, then I run the same query differentially privately. That's actually gonna, if there, in the flavor of differential privacy, privacy that Leapier does for instance, the underlying data itself is not manipulated. That, that data stays the, the same. So the distributions here are the same, the, the data looks the same. Um, it's at that point of calculation, as we just illustrated, where you're, say, calculating the count, where you're adding some randomization to the output, such that the result you get back is going to be, um, you know, not precise, but rather uh, approximate with some, uh, perhaps, uh, some, uh, some, um, uh, uh, an interval that can be characterized. So uh, that's just a, a small point, and, but it's very powerful. This, uh, this way of doing differential privacy is very powerful for, um, in practice, because it means that you don't need to create new versions of the underlying database. You don't have to replicate your data and randomize it in some way or you know, uh, uh, throw out some of the data um, every time you want to do a, a private query. You're able to keep the data, uh, the source data always stays as it is, and you're applying privacy at the point of query. Last example here, we're not going to go through this in detail. As I said, this is not going to be sort of a formalism or theory um, uh, review, but uh, just to give a, a, an impression of this, um, there are many different ways to accomplish uh, differentially private um, uh, outcomes. This is uh, a uh, stochastic gradient descent um, algorithm that's been applied in deep learning uh, fairly broadly, uh, a high level description of the algorithm. Um, the one thing that's uh, very powerful about um, differential privacy is that it's a, it's a very active area of research. There's a lot of um, open source contributions in this space. And over the years, and one thing I, sh I should have pointed out, the, the idea itself is not that old. It's on the, the, the formal uh, description of it was only uh, maybe about 15 years ago now. Uh, but over the years, then useful building blocks have become more and more broadly adopted. And so, um, you know, thing, when pieces are, are identified that are, that are useful broadly, you end up seeing them applied again and again in different contexts. And so there's a lot of reusable work in the differential privacy space. Uh, so now we're going to get into um, a bit of implementation. So first, I'll just say that, you know, the... Uh, we're still in early days of diff seeing differential privacy used uh, in the wild. Um, again, the the methodologies are um, concrete and robust, uh, but the you know it takes a while for um, large organizations, in particular, necessarily to to adopt new 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 ways of thinking about working with data. The U.S. Census Bureau um, has been one, in a sense, sort of early adopter of differential privacy. Um, some of you might have heard that they are they now you apply differential privacy to um, the data products that they develop um, coming out of the census to provide much more robust uh, privacy guarantees um, for all of us, the, the answers that we give to the questions in our census questionnaires. Um, other applications are fairly well known. Um, Apple leverages differential privacy um, to collect um, user data. Um, there's a lot of different ways that they, they use it. I forget if it's Apple or uh, some other um, uh, so OS uh, user, but uh, I know that, for instance, uh, differential privacy can be used to determine, like, you know, what are the most popular emojis as a trivial example, right? And uh, so that really kind of goes back to the example, the coin flipping example, right, where um, that's an example of, uh, of local differential privacy where um, the data that leaves your phone to support such algorithms um, is never precise, but taken an aggregate, um, you know, Apple or other organizations can can make broad conclusions about how um, their apps are being used. Uh, and then, of course, what I'm about to talk about here is uh, the, the Leap Year platform providing uh, interesting, I, I didn't sort of intend for this, but this idea of, you know, of analytics at scale or privacy at scale um, seems to be a common thread with differential privacy. Just as a side note, um, the two other uh, methods that I described earlier, uh, secure multi-party computation and fully homomorph homomorphic encryption, because they are um, based on sort of strong encryption, um, there are pretty intensive um, calculation requirements for those, uh, computational requirements. So uh, it can require quite a lot of overhead even to do fairly simple um, calculations on small data sets. Um, I, of course, the technology is moving forward all the time, but not so long ago, you know, it might take you, you know, 100 or 1,000 times longer to run a computation uh, using, um, say, uh, you know, fully homomorphic, homomorphic encryption versus um, uh, just running the raw computation. Uh, differential privacy is not nearly as computationally uh, intensive. Um, generally, the overhead is measured in terms of, say, percentages, uh, not multiples. So um, that's one reason you might see um, it, it applied to this, this terminology, applying at scale uh, fairly often. So next, uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, show uh, a little demo of uh, differential privacy uh, in, in work at work. 
Um, this is a, a technical workshop, so I'd be remiss if I didn't show some code. Uh, now, I don't expect um, anyone to, uh, you know, to be able to reproduce uh, any of the workflow that I'm showing here after such a, uh, a brief review, but I just want to give an impression for what it actually looks like um, as an end user, say a, a data scientist, to um, to perform uh, differentially private calculations. Um, the, so that the context I want to set here is leap, the Leap Your platform um, is as a, a collection of differentially private algorithms. So there are actually, if I flip over briefly here, um, there are you know dozens, if not at this point, sort of hundreds of different um, types of uh, of calculations that that Leap Year is implemented in a differentially private way. Uh, ranging from things as straightforward as count, as we just described, to um, predictive models. So, um, so the objective of the Leap Year platform is to enable end-to-end -end data science workflows uh, in in a way that's that's that always protects the the privacy and integrity of the underlying data, but enables a data scientist to to do their work productively. Um, the platform itself involves, you know, not just the differentially private calculations, but also various access controls and such that ensure that the individual doesn't have any back doors to accessing the data directly and that all of their interactions with the data happen via um, differentially private um, uh, processes. Um, but to gloss over a, a bit of that, um, the the the, the, the Leap Year API um, or the you know our, our our implementation code for this is in Python, and so you know as a as a as a data scientist, so the scenario I'll set up here is I'm I'm looking I've I've been given access to some data um, that I don't have direct access to I can't look at the underlying data, but I have this differentially private um, interface, and so I can run statistics calculations, develop models, run queries, I can merge tables together. Um, there's a lot of things, many things I can do on the data, um, but what I can't do is ever expose information about any particular record in the underlying data. Uh, and I also can't be able to reverse engineer that. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a data scientist and I'm, in this case, I'm looking at say some, uh, some healthcare data. And I wanna be able to develop a model to uh, say predict um, you know, what sort of factors lead to uh, uh, people revisiting the hospital after they've been discharged. And so I can, you know, at a glance, um, for instance, like, you know, uh, look at the, the schema of the data. Um, I, you know, look at the, the patient number. I, I might have some very sensitive information here, you know, race, gender, age, uh, et cetera. Um, so underlying all the data, you know, in my, my analysis here is, is all the entire, all the data in the database, nothing's been um, held, held away from me because I can't, um, I can't access any of this data directly. I can use it for computations, but I can't take a look at Thomas Moran's um, uh, data individually, for instance. So then, uh, you know, I want to perhaps do something useful with this data. I want to run a query that's going to look at uh, Caucasian females and look at the the, um, the hospital readmission mate for this this subgroup. And without belaboring the code, I'll just say that you know I get a number back, and this number is um, you know, say 47.75%. Uh, and I also get back some context here that tells me that like this this number is actually quite close to the true number. Um, the the likely range we call this the randomization interval is uh, just within a few percentage points, essentially like a, a rounding error of, of the value that's been returned here. This tells me a couple of things. One, I'm probably looking at a fairly large population because the the randomization interval is is so small, um, or the, the the number I'm getting back is so precise. But I also know that I'm not looking, pardon me, at the at the true true underlying data. Um, and so the point being that when I run a query in this way, I get a number back. And I get some context about that number. It's not just a wild estimate. I don't know how much, you know, I have some context for how close that number is likely to be to the true number. And again, all this information can be um, can be provided in while maintaining the, the 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 promises of differential privacy. You're not exposing any additional information by, say, releasing these ranges. Um, I can do other, as a data scientist. I can uh, look at sort of. Um, certain views of the underlying data. One thing I can't do is the first thing a lot of data scientists want to do is like look at the first, you know, the first five records of the data set. Um, that explicitly violates the, the principle of, of differential privacy where I would see the information of a, of a particular individual if I were to do that. So instead you can, uh, you know, you can shuffle otherwise sort of give an impression of what uh, of what the information in that table looks like, but again, without exposing um, any, any particular records. And that's one of the views I'm looking at here. Just a color again. I'm not going to go line by line too far for this, but there's a couple other points that I that I want to make uh, in terms of the experience of working with um, with differentially private data. 
So there are some compromises you need to make to work with the data uh, or to, to work work through differentially private algorithms. Again, I can't you know, just look at the precise data to develop intuitions, but you know, those are far outweighed by the benefits of, of working with a much broader, uh, deeper, more detailed data set than I could get uh, a hold of if I if I um, uh, was working with a data set that had been, say, you know, um, uh, anonymized or sort of otherwise sort of desensitized for for use in um, in analytics. A uh, common example of this is if you're dealing with things like zip codes, like okay, you, you use what's called a zip three in a um, in a an anonymized data set rather than zip five. Meaning, if I'm in you know uh, zip code 070040, which I am here in Maplewood. Um, and the data database, database would only say 070. And so you kind of group together all of the all of the zip codes that have 070 um, rather than just the one you're looking at. And if you do this, um, you end up losing a lot of potentially useful information. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, if we're looking at things like, you know, say the characteristics of individuals, um, you know, uh, demographics and, and other features can change quite a bit from one zip code to another. Uh, you know, there's a lot of commuter families in, in my town. There's a very particular sort of profile of individual who lives here because of its access to the city. And so what we're looking at here as an example is, you know, if you're look if we were looking at some sort of say distribution of income by um, by zip code, uh, if you look at the zip three data, you kind of just get this one sort of spike. You get an impression perhaps of like where the centrality of that value is. But if you're able to look at the, the true zip code data itself, the zip five, then you see there's a lot more structure of that data than, than you would see otherwise. There's actually there's these two humps. There's not just a you know central value here, but there's some, you know, there's some uh, sort of concentration in you know at a, at a higher end of the uh, income spectrum and some sort of concentration at a, a somewhat lower end of the spectrum. And this is just information that you lose if you um, if you are using traditional methods, but if I'm using uh, something like differential privacy, I get the benefit of all this additional statistical information uh, without again compromising any individual. Uh, let me just show one more thing. Um, uh, th I think the main takeaway, if I ask you to have one takeaway from this, it's like, oh, okay, differential privacy, um, it's a real thing. You can do, uh, you know, you can, uh, there are tools for applying differential privacy today. With differential privacy, I can potentially get access to data that I couldn't otherwise get access to, which allows me as a data scientist or analyst to um, have much more meaningful insights than if I if I didn't have that. Oh, and furthermore, it doesn't have to be horribly complicated to, to work with a differential privacy. Some of this code might look complicated, but it's actually just because it's, um, this is just, uh, if you don't know Python, it looks complicated, but this is actually the, the, the calculations themselves or the, the, the code itself is actually quite similar to what you would use uh, if you were just writing these queries using, you know, uh, any any other sort of tool. So, um, so with relatively uh, uh, sort of small learning curve, I can get access to much more uh, granular data than I might otherwise. And I can't, it's not just for doing things like counts and means. I mentioned a few times the ability to say train, um, you know, train machine learning models. And so, you know, uh, in this case, the leap year has a, um, you know, a random forest module. So this is like, this is our differentially private random forest. I run this with, you know, a few lines of code. And I get an output that you know the model itself, the model performance such um, is going to look, uh, you know, the way I value it would be quite similar as if I was running it on, uh, you know, in a non-differentially private way. Um, so I hope that that has, you know, this very brief demo um, sort of hit the points that I mentioned, just in terms of giving an impression that this is um, a, a real and, and very powerful capability. Um, the last, I guess, imagery I'll leave with you here is that. So maybe I need to zoom out just a bit here, but. Um, what I'm showing is just an example. I'm not gonna. If you're if you're familiar with the receiver operating curve or characteristic curve, great. Uh, if not, well, I'm just going to assert here that what this tells me is that the model that I develop with um, with differential privacy, which is able to act on the all of the data, all the all the attributes of the data set and the most granular attributes of the data set, for instance, zip five instead of zip three, gives me better results. Than trading a model on, you know, a, a data set that that excludes certain features because they're considered too private, or has otherwise sort of dumbed down the data in some way. That's intuitive uh, for any data science or analyst. Having more data at your disposal, more granular, um, will result in better models. Uh, but it's something I just I want to convey that we we certainly see uh, in the wild uh, as well, and it's a, an important um, part of the value of differential privacy. So we're just about at the end here. Uh, I do want to just briefly um, 
share a couple resources. I'm not sure. I, I'll 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 share these on the um, the Whova app a little later, perhaps as well. I wouldn't expect you necessarily, but if you want to write down, if you're interested in this topic, you want to write write down some keywords to do a Google search. I'll dwell here for a second, um, uh, so you can do so. Uh, you know, one of the um, the foundational works uh, on this uh, was by um, Cynthia Dwork and Aaron Roth, and uh, there's a really great online resource that just came up a, 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 about a year ago. Actually, I don't have any affiliation with it, but these guys did a really good job of uh, providing some interactive notebooks online that describe uh, programming with different in with, uh, differential privacy uh, in, a, in a Python interface. Um, so if you have even the slightest interest in it, it's a it's a really really great resource um, that'll give you very strong hands on intuitions for um, how to implement and use differential privacy in your day to day work. Uh, and with that, I would love to pause for uh, any Q and A. I want to thank you for your time. Um, just. Just in case any folks uh, don't stick around for the Q and I do want to just um, advise you to stick around after after um, the session for for networking in the in the Whova app. But um, other than that, I'll now uh, try to get my screen back so I can see where any questions are coming from. Thank you very much. So there's uh, there's two questions in there from uh, Jason Jacob. I don't know if you see that uh, in there. Yeah, let me chat portion of the Teams app. Sure. Uh, yeah, let's see here. So, yeah, from from uh, Jason, the amount of data that's regularly processed. Uh, I'll just read it out loud uh, uh, slowly. For the amount of data that's regularly processed through organizations, what tools and platforms are there to use for computational data privacy? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I obviously just uh, you know gave one example of that you know a biased example uh, with our, our, our company Leap Year. Um, that provides I, really what we have is the um, I think first and only of its kind so end-to-end -end enterprise grade analytic platform for um, for doing these sorts of workflows where you can enable uh, you know scenario I would lay out is like you know you are um, uh, I say a healthcare company and you want to enable external analysts to 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 perform some you know to to use your data to drive their research. Um, you can use the Leap Year platform to enable these end-to-end -end, uh, data science workflows without ever actually giving them access to underlying data. Um, there are a number of uh, open source, a lot of open source efforts in this in this space. Uh, one is called quite simply OpenDP. Um, that is done. In, there's a group out of Harvard that's involved in it. I think I think it's also the one that uh, Microsoft is a partner with them in that as well. Um, but there's a number of other open source. If you just if you were to search for open source differential privacy, you'll come up with a, a few different results there. For the other um, uh, methods that we covered, uh, SMPC and um, FHE, uh, I am bluntly less familiar with um, who's providing solutions in that space. There's um, a number of you know, relatively new companies that are sort of spinning up there. Um, I th would say that the the good news, even though I don't have uh, maybe great answers for you in those domains. I would say um, because there are relatively few uh, players in that space right now, then um, you know a, a quick web, web search will probably unveil the you know the dozen or so um, uh, offerings that are out there that are fairly far along. And there are, are also certainly um, uh, a number of uh, uh, open source implementations for uh, for both of those methods and and others as well. Um, just the other question from G. Jason here, uh, I've seen privacy engineering roles continue to grow in Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley and, and STEM based companies. Will other companies and organizations start taking a similar approach? Yes, and here's how that's going to work. Um, so right now, uh, one of the opportunities and challenges of being a startup in this space is that um, you know we, on the one hand, get to be say the first to market. Uh, with solutions. On the other hand, it's also uh, we also need to help educate our, our customers on how they can apply this technology. Um, in a short amount of time, the folks who are becoming our customers today are going to need their own internal um, sort of specialists in this domain as well. Um, so, so yeah, it's and, and by and when I talk about those customers, I mean a lot of these are legacy sort of you know. Um, uh, uh, 
20th century organizations who have a lot of data that need to be able to share, whether it's in the finance space or, or, or you know, health or um, bio research or whatever it is. Anybody who's got sensitive data um, is going to need to build their capacity around being able to share that data both internally, say to drive research and, and innovation, and also externally, whether it's for direct monetization or, or some other purpose. So, uh, but from what I've seen, uh, every large company in every domain in the next five years, there'll be growth in the need for these sorts of roles. Um, from Beth, uh, what are the worst breaches and responses that, that I've experienced? Um, well, um, my answer might be a little disappointing here in the sense that um, we haven't been part of, we, uh, well, maybe I'll put it as this, Leap Year as an organization at least tends to get called in after there was a bad breach, right? So um, me and the customer realized that they needed to take um, data privacy much more, uh, much more seriously than they are now. One thing I'll say is like every organization in the world um, uh, up till the last thing, you know, a few years ago, was using all the same techniques. Everyone was using anonymization, and they had the same sort of heuristic rules for what information they would release or what they wouldn't. Meaning they were like, you know, obscuring name and social security number, and it made everybody susceptible to the same sorts of privacy attacks then as well. So um, these sorts of problems were, you know, unfortunately quite pre prevalent for a long time. Um, but to answer your question with a somewhat less obvious uh, example, I suppose, we work in, do a lot of work in financial services, working with large banks that um, need to be able to share data, but um, but also need to protect the, the privacy of their, their clients and customers. Um, we uh, started working with one bank after uh, one of their larger clients um, came to the realization that some of the data products that the bank was, was sharing um, externally to say summarized um, you know, investment activity, for instance, that some of the data products they were sharing were actually like uh, essentially exposing that, that, that client's uh, uh, you know, trades and strategies. Um, like the, the client got that data, they were, they were a customer of the data product and they looked at it and they said like, well, this is really doing nothing more than just showing exactly what we were doing over these dates because they were such a, a large player in that domain that their trades were sort of swamping out what everyone else was doing. Uh, and you know, long story short, they ended up losing the business of this very large customer. And so in financial services, for instance, you have a dynamic where the most sensitive information comes from those who kind of have the most to lose, meaning those who are like doing the biggest trades. And those also tend to be the largest customers for, or are in fact the largest customers for banks. And so we've you know, seen those situations where um, a lapse of uh, confidentiality with these historical uh, methods um, led to ultimately, I mean, unfortunately, a loss for for the for you know for the bank, uh, but an opportunity for us to come in and provide you know some real privacy assurances as opposed to um, you know the unfortunately you know quite um, uh, inadequate protections that have been in place historically. Any other questions? I know that um, I think it's the case at least that a lot of the folks on here are also. Um, you know our students so uh i'm also got a few minutes I'd, i'll also say that I've, I've done a lot of uh hiring uh over the years and so i i will i should, should say up front unfortunately leap is not hiring like at we're, we're hiring but at a um at a sort of for fairly sort of advanced level right now so if you happen to be somebody who's got you know a number of years uh of experience you know writing code in startups that'd be great but um we're not generally recruiting out of um like right out of uh undergrad uh at this point possibly grad school um, but if there are any general questions about just sort of the the the, um, the um, you know the, the trends or sort of uh, setting for roles in tech just in general right now, happy to answer any any general questions as well. Maybe everyone's already got job offers in your you uh, you don't need any more advice. Okay, well, it's been a long day for everyone. I'll wait another beat to see if any additional questions pop in. Uh, great, from Joseph. Uh, make you more, oh yeah, any tips on what we can do to make, make us more marketable outside of college? Yes, I do have tips. Um, there's a few straightforward things you can do to differentiate, your, say, differentiate yourself from uh, the you know other recent college graduates. One, uh, have something that um, have have work somewhere that I can look at. 
So, uh, and by that I mean, as a someone who's a hiring manager who's reviewing lots of resumes, um, if somewhere on your resume uh, you describe, you know, a project that you were involved in, or an interest of yours, or whatever it is, and you can point me to a very concise uh, sort of summary of that work online somewhere. Um, I'm not going to guarantee that I'm necessarily going to look at it. I'll be honest, like I'm that guy who's like spending 30 seconds on a resume trying to decide like how to prioritize him. And so it doesn't always happen, but it's going to catch my eye because it's going to tell me a couple things. It's going to tell me that this is somebody who, who is willing to put their work out there and you know, that they're, uh, that, you know, they're, they're willing to put themselves under some scrutiny and what they're able to do. And when I talk about, you know, putting something up, it could be, uh, any number of things. It could be, you know, if you're a programmer, uh, you could put up a little web app that just does, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, too impressive or, or original even, but just something that sort of shows like, oh, this is a person who actually programs and here's a nifty web app that does something they think is interesting. If you're a data scientist, you could make a Medium blog post or a blog post on Medium or, or some other setting uh, that just describes a problem that you solved. It can be a class problem. It doesn't really matter, like the nature of the problem. Something that's interesting to you uh, if you want, but just gives me somewhere I can go to look at it and say, oh, here, get uh, understand a little more about who you are as somebody who, who does their work. And like I said, even if I don't go to the site, I already respect the fact that you were willing to like stick, you know, put your neck out there and provide a link to, um, you know, to, to some of your work. Um, the, the other piece of advice I'd give um, is uh, to um, do something, <laughs> meaning, uh, uh, so I got some good advice from a friend of mine who he's an executive in the, um, in the entertainment industry. And I was asking him on behalf of somebody else, like, well, you know, uh, what are you looking for in candidates? It's like, I just want somebody who's like, you know, I, I want to see somebody who's gone out and actually tried to do something. Um, if you, you know, if you want to do marketing, then start a marketing company. Well, what does that mean? It just means maybe you work with, um, you work with, uh, you know, a, a group on campus to help them incre increase awareness about, you know, a singing club or a sports organization or something, right? But you you get involved in some way. You do some, um, you apply um, your interests in some meaningful way. Um, it doesn't mean you have to form an LLC and have revenue. It doesn't mean that at all. It could also mean you, you know, you've got a Twitter account. You're helping other people or, or you're helping people sort of maintain their social media um, presence. It's just something that you can point to. And these, the commonality here in both cases is give me something that I can look at, that I can I can see that you do. And you'll have immediately differentiated yourself from, you know, 95 to 99 percent of, of candidates um, for whom it's frankly very hard to discern uh, you know, who, who the strongest candidates are, um, from just say coursework alone. So those are my, my, that's my four minutes of advice as far as that goes. Okay. I think we are at right. time. Thank you everyone for your attention and just a reminder again, stick around for the networking in the, um, actually I don't, I, I shouldn't know by now if it's called, if it's Hoover or Hova, Hova it must be, uh, and in the app and, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Thomas. That was great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.